Uh, I'm excited to share this word with you because this is so much what I'm about. This is so. I'm, this is what I've been preaching uh, for a good while, and a lot of people to the point where they go, "Man, all you talk about is money." It's not the money. It's not the money. It's the influence that you can have through the mountain of business. And so I want to revisit this subject, and uh, I share a little video with you at the end. That's really killer, really unbelievable. But 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 the time that we're living in. Uh, is the fulfillment of Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 3. If you'll stand for the reading of the word, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. To be living at this time is the greatest, greatest blessing for a Christian. It's not the worst time to be alive. It's the best time to be alive. There's just so many cool things that are happening, and we're excited about it. And so we see this prophecy coming to pass, and so we ask you, Lord, to bless this word and anoint it as only you can and get the hearts, open the eyes, Of your people so they can see in Jesus name starting Isaiah chapter 2 verse 1 the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem now I say it now it shall come to pass that in the latter days say latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it And many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. You may be seated. So the the Hebrew word here for latter days is akarith. A derivative of that is akaron. And here's what it means. Last. The last generation. This prophecy was seen by a prophet thousands of years ago, and he was seeing today and now the times today. And he was, and the word he has is everybody, everywhere you go, everybody is discouraged in the church. Oh my God, you know, everything's going to heck in a handbasket. The church is just, you know, just going to pot. La da 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 da. The prophet says that in the last days that the mountain of God will be lifted up. It would be the main mountain of society and all of the cultures will come to it to learn God's ways. The nations, the nations, the word there for nations is gohim. It means the Gentile, the unsaved will begin to come to the mountain of God to find out his ways and search out his paths and begin to apply that to his life. That sounds like an end time revival to me. And that's, and this is, this is, this is one of the most reliable, credible prophets that has ever lived, the prophet Isaiah, has said in the last generation, and the last generation doesn't mean the world is going to be over or in. That's not what last means. Last generation is the last generation of the era of grace, the era of the church. What's the next generation? The next generation is Jesus Christ coming here, living here in the flesh, and reigning and ruling the earth from Jerusalem, the millennial thousand-year reign of Christ. That's the next, that's the next era But before that era comes, there's something going to happen. Everybody wants to talk about, everybody wants to talk about the tribulation. And I'm excited. I've talked about the tribulation as much as anybody. But nobody talks about the end time revival. Nobody talks about the church becoming significant again. Nobody talks about even government looking to the church for direction around the world. Not just here. That's what this prophecy says. And to validate the accuracy of the prophecy, there were three men, great men of God, great men of the faith, who in the 1970s, early 70s, received this vision simultaneously, and they were on three different continents when it happened. They didn't discover that they had gotten it, that they had simultaneously gotten it until they got together years later. These three men were Francis Schaeffer, the great Presbyterian minister, Lauren Cunningham, who headed up Youth with a Mission, which is an incredible organization, and Bill Bride of Campus Crusade for Christ. God has used these men. They're gone now. But God has used these men in powerful, powerful ways to do incredible works on the face of the earth. And they were all given this seven mountains prophecy that the church had to begin to, the, to and, and I don't want to use the word attack because that sends out the wrong the wrong connotation, but the church had begun to begin to have an influence in seven areas of culture. If it was going to change the culture, it had to do it from the inside out, not from the outside in. And that we had to be 
on these mountains. And these are the seven mountains. Uh, if you'll show the slide. Hey, she beat me to it. Arts and entertainment, business, education, family, government, media, and religion. No one, listen to me now, no one has ever lived who has impacted our understanding of reality like Jesus Christ. Nobody. And his method was not political. It was apolitical. Jesus was not a politician. He believed the way you change societies and what he taught us is by changing the human heart. You change the heart and the politics catch up. Come on, somebody. Now look, I think Christians have been quiet too long and we've let some fringe lunatics in our society kind of, you know, get off the... And I believe in becoming active politically. But I, and Roger, who's in our, in our ministry and the fulfillment of the Lord's word for him, is, is having was in Washington, D.C. here last week. He's been Austin several times and, and, and God has put him in a position to pray for. He prayed for several prominent U.S. senators, a couple of prominent or congressmen, were they congressmen, I guess, while he was up there that you would recognize their names if you heard. He had, the Lord opened the door for him to lay hands on them and pray for them. We're supposed to be involved in the political arena, but the change comes when the heart changes. And what changes the heart you ready for it? It's the love of Jesus Christ. The love of Jesus Christ. That's what changes the human heart. And we should take that on these seven mountains and we should be an influence because the top 2% of the mountain determines what the other 98% below it thinks. So the premise is, is that you commit your life, if you're in education, and we have some great educators in here. I always point to them, you're not the only teachers we have. But they're the boss of the teachers, so that's why I point to them, amen? We have great educators in here. We have nurses in here. We have doctors. We have, we have, we have, we have people that have, are in a position, not just Roger, to have great influence where they're, in the, in the, in the mountain that they're planted on, but they think that's, you know, I'm not supposed to be spiritual there. It's supposed to be all business. You can't change the culture that way. You have to be Jesus to people in your workplace. And, and that we should dominate in these seven areas and that we should become and should influence the culture for Christ. We should, we should, we should plant on the mountains we, that we have been planted on. We should have success. And it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 through 24, it says, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward and the inheritance for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord will promote you. The Lord will make a way. I taught this message in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Three years ago, hadn't it? Oh, my God. They're going to fire me if I don't get back down there. Anyway... <clears throat> I taught this message in Baton Rouge, Louisiana about this having influence and being influential in the mountain that you're planted on. And there was a, young, a guy, a middle-aged guy came up to me after the service and he said, man, I'm, you, you, you just described my life. He said, I'm a, I was a pipeline welder. When I was a young man, I went to work for Exxon in that big refinery. How many of you have seen the Exxon refinery in Baton Rouge, Louisiana? Oh my God, it's one of the world's biggest refineries. It's unbelievable. It's like... At night, it's just pipes and lights and like, you can't believe how vast it is. Well, this guy went to work working on, working on, on welding pipes in there and, and, he, and he would, they would have a problem, and this is his testimony, and they would have a problem and they would have a valve sticking or something. I don't know what kind of problems they have there, but, but, but he, nobody could fix it. And he would ask the Lord, he says, well, how do we fix it, Lord? And the Lord would show him. And so he would go fix it. And do what the Lord showed him to fix it. How many of you believe the Lord's a good engineer? And so they would come to him and they would say, man, the engineers would come. We don't know how to fix it. Get Fred. Go call. Let him. He does the praying thing. I don't know what he does. But he'll, he'll get it fixed. And he said, they began to promote me. And he said, now he's the head of engineering. And he doesn't have a college degree. And I'm not against college. I love college. My son was a college teacher. But he has no engineering degree in college and he's been promoted to where he's the head of engineering for this vast, internationally significant 
internationally significant refinery. And he has under him like 120 people. And he's discipled under him. He immediately has like 12 managers. And he has led them all to the Lord and he's discipled them. And they in turn are discipling the ones under them and they're, this is the way it's supposed to work. He didn't get promoted because he had great theology. He got promoted because he could fix, the, he had an answer for the problems. Ask the Lord, he'll show you how to fix it. And then in due time, he'll promote you. That's how you become a leader in these other mountains. That is, that is serving Christ. And the business and financial mountain right now is currently, it's the most influential of all the mountains because everything, uh, everything that happens has to have its provision and it has, has, has to be paid for through the business and financial mountain and now currently even some of the religious stuff that people are doing. But it's currently the most vulnerable. It's under the most attack. It's under the most shaking. Failure of man's system. The failure of the Babylonian financial system. For 40 years, for 40 years, we've been making a mistake with our Federal Reserve and the treatment of our currency, and it's caught up with us now until our system is under, the world system is under huge stress. And there are intellectuals who advocate that we have to go to a communist or a socialist system to correct the errors of the, man, I'm going to tell you this right now, that is absolutely not of God. God is for the individual. He's for the, he's for the freedom of the individual to be and do what he's created him to be and do. So the dot-com bubble back in the 90s, the markets lost $4.6 trillion in value. That's a lot. In the housing bubble in 2007 and 8, maybe some of you remember that, the market lost $2.3 trillion in value, but we nearly lost the banking system. The COVID-19 sell-off in 2020, the market lost $4.4 trillion. In the current bubble that's being burst, we've lost $7 trillion and we're not done yet. It gets progressively worse. And that doesn't even count cryptocurrency, which some, oh my God, it lost $265 billion in one day. 40% of the positions in cryptocurrency are underwater. 40% of the people that bought cryptocurrency are in a losing position. Nobody knows for sure how much it's lost, but around a trillion dollars. And on top of that, now they've decided that if you, if you were a holder of a position in Terra and some of these other, some of these other coin holding things, that you could be subject to bankruptcy law. What does that mean? That means you're like a shareholder, that if it goes bankrupt, and there's not enough to go around to pay the creditors, they can come back on you. They, the very minimum that they can do is freeze your assets while they, it's a mess. Can I get a witness out of somebody? It's a mess. And it's causing a lot of pain. And there's opportunity. There's absolute opportunity. It's, absolute, it's even created worldwide famine. In Sri Lanka, how many of you were in here when I told you famine was coming next? Do you remember that service? <clears throat> You've seen all these other signs and famine is the next one that's coming and it's here in Sri Lanka. They have burned 30 politicians' homes to the ground because the people are starving. India gave Egypt a little bit of wheat when they had, had an embargo and are not going to export any wheat. And nearly every nation... Every nation in the world right now has put <coughs> an export embargo on wheat and corn and grains. They won't, if they produce it, they won't export any of it. They gave Egypt a little bit to avert a disaster. There is unrest in the streets, and you're about to see things happen. The big threat, so listen to me, the big threat is not financial. The big threat now is geopolitical. Marie Antoinette was the queen of France. Whenever they told her her subjects were starving, she said, let them eat cake. When that word of that got out to the public, they quickly started a revolution. She was arrested. They drug her to the guillotine, and they beheaded her. When your masses are starving, the trip from the palace to the guillotine is a short one. 
And you're going to see massive unrest. You're going to see unrest in Latin America. You're going to see unrest in lots and lots of nations. There's a tremendous disruption. There's a tremendous geopolitical disruption ahead. You, the, 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 the Russian-Ukraine thing is a drop in the bucket. Ukraine's going to survive. They're going to start producing wheat again, and they'll be an exporter, but it's going to be too late. We're two crops. We, got, we have China has a seven-month supply of corn on hand, but the rest of the nations of the world, the average is about two months. How long does it take for corn to grow? <laughs> we don't even have it planted yet. Roger's still trying to get his planted. Are you starting to get the picture? There's a massive disruption because of failures. And you can trace all of this back to a demonic plan called ESG. It was a plan by big names and big, big, big hedge funds who control big blocks of stock <coughs> that, <coughs> that wouldn't discourage investment in, in fossil fuels, discourage investment in any of that stuff. I would like to pl place it on the, the feet of one political party, but actually it was, it was like, it was like a, an internal sort of a thing. The business, the big business community decided it was time to push this. Now, I'm not against environmental, taking care of the environment or any of that, but you can't turn everybody into driving electric cars overnight. That's just stupid. You can't, you have to have a transition plan to get from one place to the other. They didn't, now we're in a big wreck. And, it, and you just, you're just starting to see the beginning of it. But I'm here to tell you, it's part of the shaking that God told us about six years ago. I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. But you tell the remnant, it shall go well with them. Tell them to get to work, for my spirit still abides with them. Tell them that the silver and gold is mine. It's coming back into my house. That there's going to be a tremendous, that, that, that speaks to a tremendous financial shaking in the world. But the last part of that prophetic word, if you remember it was, but you tell them that the glory of the church, the glory of the church, of the latter church will exceed that of the former. That sounds like Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, where the church rises in influence. But you have to shake things up for that to happen. And we're seeing it happen right now. But we're in the age... We're in the age of the stewards. I've preached this before too. The stewards who are, who are business people, who understand how businesses work, then are good financial stewards. This is their time. This is the time that Jesus talked about in Matthew 25 when he said, when I come back, I don't want to meet with the pastors and preachers and apostles. I want to meet with the stewards. I want to know what did you do with the opportunity I gave you in the season of the shaking? Because if you remember, there were three of them. One of them hid his because he said, oh, it's bad. And Jesus cast him out because he obviously didn't understand the times. But the other two made shrewd investments and they became influential in the business mountain and they influenced society and they turned this thing around. I love that song, Lord, turn this thing around. He's about to. But it's going to sling a lot of people off the ship if they're not looking for it. And the age of the stewards is the age and the Joseph's anointing Tony Kemp came through those doors right here three years ago, and he said, God is releasing a Joseph's anointing in this church. What is it? And in this region, what's a Joseph's anointing? What did Jesus, what did Joseph do? He had the wheat. He knew what the people needed. He made provision. He became a shrewd leader in government and business. He took care of God's people. And that's the times that we're living in. We don't need to get caught up in the... In the in the news, we need to look for opportunity because there's a shaking everywhere. I've never seen a time, I've got to tell you this, this is not in my notes, but I've never seen a time where a young man who wants to work can make money. I'm talking about a plumber, an electrician, a good carpenter. My goodness gracious, has any of you ever tried to hire a plumber in here recently? Oh my God. A young man who wants to work, there's just no limit to the opportunity. If you'll get a trade and adopt a trade and get, and get involved in, in whatever, there's just, there are so much opportunity in Luke 19, 13. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, do business until I come. Stay engaged in the business area. Don't forsake it because it's falling apart. Make a difference. 
So what exactly does this look like? So when I talk about this and teach this, people go, you're just talking about money. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about influence. I'm talking about having what people need so you can provide for them when they need it. I'm talking about being in a position to, to make a tremendous influence in the workplace. We need to rescue the workplace from the devil. And we need to get Jesus king over the workplace again. A place where is more than a place where people go to work, but it's a place where people learn about Christ. It's a place where people pray for each other. It's a place where people make a difference. It's a place where their talents are cultivated. It's a place where they're, 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 they discover who they are and what they're good at, and they begin to do it, and, they begin to, and it becomes profitable for everybody. It's a place where Jesus reigns, the workplace. Well, what does that look like? Because you don't see that much anymore. Carol and I are blessed to have two in our, in our Acts ministry, Associated Churches Through Service is our apostolic work. And we have about 18 or 20 young ministers. Well, some are old. Bruce is old. But <clears throat> we, have, we have some young ministers that are making a heck of a difference in and i got to tell you, my biggest struggle is it doesn't look to me like the church. I mean, it, it, you see them making a difference. You see them have an impact for Christ. You see how God's working through them, and it don't look like my traditional definition of church. So I'm supposed to be leading them, and I'm not sure where we're going. But I'll tell you one thing. They are having a powerful, powerful impact in the communities that they're in. And two of them are Trevor and Ashley Turnbull from Muleshoe. And they started a company called Evolve. They're an embroidery company. All the caps you see, the barn church caps, everything in here that we get, they make. And <clears throat> they committed this thing to the Lord. And, <clears throat> and they became known. There's a group out of Lubbock called <clears throat> uh, Kingdom in the Workplace. And they got, they got wind about their business, and they wanted to come make a video and do a little story about their business. And, and I can't think of a better way for you to understand what I'm talking about here, what kingdom in the workplace looks like. So we have a little video here. <laughs> Love is the greatest commandment. Why shouldn't it be the center? And as we look back, it's amazing to see where we started, what we've gone through, and where we're headed. Because love is, is at the beginning and at the middle and at the end. Me and Ashley were coaching and teaching at a junior high, and we both ended up quitting at the same time to stay home. So there was a, a local couple that had a screen printing company, just all manual, and we decided that would be fun. Let's see if they want to sell. And they said, no, um, we love what we're doing, but everybody always asks us for embroidery. So look into it. The idea of Evolve was born right there at supper that evening. And within a month, we have a machine coming from Japan, and we're wondering where we're putting it, and we find a building on Main Street Mule Shoe. We're faith people. And that was one of the biggest leaps of faith we took as a family, as a growing family. From the beginning, we said, whatever God does, like, let's let it be His. And I think if we had any idea what that would have meant, we probably would have thought it through. I went into Evolve wanting it to be different than what I knew. I wanted it to be a place that our employees enjoyed coming, that our customers would walk in and feel joy. And so we want to see people flourish in that atmosphere, that environment. The biggest thing about Evolve is 
we have fun. Even in the Christmas season, when we are so stinking busy, there's always so much laughter. Our bosses, are they want that. They want us to take five minutes and throw snowballs, and they encourage it, and they participate. I worked alongside everybody all day, and I naturally carried on conversation, kids and life and whatever. People build you up, and, and you work in you know, tandem together. It's not the usual people kind of climbing and scratching and clawing over one another, trying to be noticed or be on top. You know, everybody goes through their own personal stuff, and whenever you get in the prayer circle in the mornings, and you can just feel people rally around you and feel them lift you up. And it's awesome. One of our core values is promote community. So every Thursday morning, we're out praying for a business in town. We're taking what we do on a daily basis and we're introducing other people and other businesses around town to do the same. We just let them know that we care about this community. We're a part of this community. I mean, we're going on two years and we've not run out of businesses, which is really cool because this is Mule Shoe, Texas. You can see how much it means to the community when we're out there. And I love that they get to see a little bit of what Evolve is all about. So God moves whether you're ready or not. Evolve had become so great so fast that um, we had lost our family. I was driving home from work one day. I just said a prayer and I said, Lord, I don't like where I'm at. I don't like where my family's at, but I don't know what to change. So Lord, I need you to fling doors open and slam doors shut. And so Angel was gone to church camp for a full week and Corey was off flying in Hugoton, Kansas. And Trevor and I were here and we had no communication with them. The cell phone service was awful. So we led Evolve for a week by ourselves. And in our kitchen that weekend, we looked at each other and said, is this what it's supposed to feel like? And that next week, Corey and Angel said that the Lord showed them both that week that they were called to Hugoton. When we figured out that it would all split, we sat down with our accountant, and she looked at all four of us and said, I've never seen one of these go well. I've never seen a partnership end, and they're still friends at the end. And I looked her in the eye, and I said, you're fixing to have your first. So if God's turning pages, changing directions, you have to choose to be obedient. Had Corey and Angel not chosen to be obedient, I can't say that Evolve would be standing right now. We were forced to ask ourselves some hard questions and, and make some big decisions, but I knew we could do it. We were forced to put people in places that we didn't think they were ready, when in reality, it just required us to put forth more effort in supporting them to make sure they're ready. But there's no way, looking back, we would be where we are if the four of us still had the control that we tried to maintain. I've had one-on-ones with Ashley for two years, and that lady is in touch with God, and she truly, truly cares about her employees. I have a lot of work experience. A lot of that is because I lost a lot of jobs because of my depression. But the biggest difference that I've noticed is that they really care about me, and I have never worked in a job where they really cared about me. I just really, truly love just that time with her and knowing that whatever is being poured out is true and raw and it's being taken and um, really thought about and prayed about and it's really refreshing. God has put me here on earth as a teacher to, to walk people through and to be patient with people and to help them see from a new perspective. You're called to cultivate the soil so that when those seeds fall, they're not choked out, they're not burned up. So we get to take that product that God created and we get to add some color and some words and we make it final 
and then we get to box it up. And then they get to leave and go do what they were ordered for. Love is the greatest commandment. Why shouldn't it be the sinner? So why can't you run a business that way? Why can't you run a school district that way? Why can't you run a farm that way? They have proven that whenever you put Jesus first in whatever it is that you're doing and care about the people that he sends to you and try to minister and try to love them the way Christ would love them, you know, I come from a, a long line of business people, and that's like a recipe for disaster. I mean, you'll have people that will start shirking tasks and making excuses and you're not going to get anything done. That's the most productive bunch I have ever seen. Carol and I, when we go over there to Trevor, I've said this before, we go to Trevor and Ashley's house to have lunch or dinner, and it's like we have to rest when we get home watching them. I mean, they got four young girls Ashley is on the school board in, the, in, in Mule Shield School District. Trevor is on the Emmaus board, serves with me and Marianne on the Emmaus uh, board. They work walks. They're like, and they have these young kids, and they're, they're, they're making it all work. Yeah, I think being young helps. <laughs> Amen? I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's kind of the main ingredient. But my point is, why in the world would we not want Christ to be in charge of the workplace? Because he is there. And they don't have, they have very few people. They have some come and go. But most of the people you saw in that video have been with them for a long time. And Corey and, Corey and Angel, Angel has spoken here. You heard her come here and share her testimony about discipleship. They've been very successful in Hugoton, Kansas with a spraying business up there. God wants you to prosper so that you can have an influence on people and impact their lives positively. That doesn't seem complicated to me. Well, you're not talking about that prosperity again, are you? How, do you, how are you going to employ all those people if you're not making any money? Amen. I think we're living in a time when God wants us to take possession of the marketplace. And start to do it different. I think, I think these devices, these financial devices, I think God's, I think God's uh, uh, theory of business is that you get people together and you love on them and you create something that people want and need. And the rest of it takes care of it. I'll take care of the rest of it. I don't think you've got to get... I don't think you've got to be like, you know, have a financial degree in treasury bonds. There's nothing wrong with that. But this is where the action is. This is where you really see God making a difference. Amen? You can run a school that way. I think you can run any organization that way. Hey, this is crazy. What if you start running a church that way? Oh, my God. Sometimes... I'm just being honest with you. Sometimes I have to beat that old business hard dose background down in my own life and say that's it's about love. It begins, it, it's, it's the beginning, the middle, and the end. That's what she said. Loving people. Carol and I are really proud of them. And we try to help them every way we can. We just we can't keep their kids. That's just too much. I don't have the energy for that. <laughs> but I talk to Trevor <clears throat> or Ashley usually. We talk to them two or three times a month, and they have issues. We try to help them work through. But by and large, we've ministered to a lot of their, a lot of their employees. How many of you think the church would be really, really successful if it would start looking like that right there? Amen? Well, you know what? We can do it. We can make a difference. We can make a difference in the way we run our business, the way we treat our employees. We've got to show them Jesus. We have to show them the love of Jesus. And I'll tell you something. If you know Ashley, you know she don't put up with excuses either. I'm not talking about being weak. She believes in you. She's going to get it out of you. 
but you always know that she loves you. Amen. Trevor, he's kind of the, Trevor's real quiet. You could tell the difference. He's kind, of, he's kind of her chick, you know. He keeps her from falling off the cliff. You know, he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, Ashley. You need to slow down a little bit. But, <clears throat> but I, I, want, I want to see that in my, I want to see that now. I want to see our people starting to think like that, starting to make the marketplace look like that, starting to have that kind of impact. How many of you want that? How many of you want to be involved in that? Amen.